Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, Chuco, to our very first Sustainable Palm Oil uh, Forum. Uh, my name is uh, Mike Haslin. I have the pleasure of welcoming you today uh, to this fabulous event. We're so thrilled to see so many of our members and suppliers and key stakeholders here. Uh, this, who would have thought a day of oil and fats would be so popular? Um, I was fortunate enough to be invited by the RSPO to a launch event last year um, and I went down having thinking I had some knowledge of uh, palm oil in particular and was very quickly within two minutes of standing there in the room had my whole thoughts changed within minutes now I'm not going to steal Judith's thunder by telling her what um, she told me that day but it was fascinating so the insights that we've got lined up with a really great panel of speakers uh, should be really informative and what the day is designed to do is to raise awareness and to raise the actual facts of the important issues of the key oils and fats that we're using every day in nearly every product that we uh, have so uh, I hope you enjoy the day and welcome again without further ado it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Kevin McAllister from AAK and he will be talking about oils and fats the top line introduction so uh, welcome everybody good morning everyone can everybody hear me yeah yeah all at the back can hear me okay good I am from Liverpool so normally you know if you can't email just shout and you know then it's an accent problem not a volume issue um, I just want to talk today a little bit about oils and fats, how they're used, uh, and the chemistry. But don't worry that we're not going to go back to O-level chemistry and get your periodic tables out. You know, you don't need to, to be concerned about that. But the first question really is, what are fats and oils? You know, what's the definition of them? Well, in very simple terms, fats are solid at room temperature and oils are liquid at room temperature. And you might think, well, that's straightforward enough. But if we're well, here in the UK and you have some palm oil, it is a fat because the ambient temperature here in the UK is cool enough that it's solid. But if we go to the areas of the world where it's grown in Malaysia and Indonesia, mainly Papua New Guinea and Southeast Asia, some parts of Africa and South America, it's more likely to be an oil because the ambient temperature is much higher. That makes sense, I guess. Most of you have seen rapeseed oil in the supermarkets and here in the UK, rapeseed oil is a liquid oil. If we went to the North Pole, not that we find any Tesco's or Sainsbury's at the North Pole, but if we did, it would be a fat, because it's so cold that the, the oil would be too hard, it wouldn't pour. <clears throat> so whilst this is a simple definition, it also depends where we are in the world. But I'll just make sure that we, we only talk about the UK. So oils and fats are mixtures of triglycerides or triacylglycerols, and these are effectively a glycerol molecule with three fatty acids attached and they look a little bit like that with the red band being a saturated fatty acid I'm sure you've all heard of that uh, word before the middle one being a mono unsaturate and the bottom one being a polyunsaturate so that's two or more double bonds <coughs> and the characteristics of oils and fats are determined by two things mainly number one the type of uh, length, sorry, the length of the chain and then the type of fatty acid, whether it's a saturate, a mono or a polyunsaturate that's linked to it. And you have those that are saturated without any double bonds and you can see that's quite straight. You have monounsaturates with one double bond and you can see there's a kink in that fatty acid. And then polyunsaturates, which is two or more double bonds, you can see there's more kinks. And so when you, when you think about that, uh, you can understand why there's different uh, melting points and different amounts of energy required to separate those fatty acids. The other issue is how long the chain lengths are, and these are just hydrocarbons. You can see the difference in caprylic acid, which is C8, melt around 16 degrees Celsius, with behenic acid, which is 22 carbons, which melt at 80 degrees, so there's a significant difference. And then the difference in unsaturation with stearic acid, which is C18, a saturated fatty acid, melts just around 70 Celsius, versus linolenic acid melts around minus 11. So both with 18 carbons in the chain, just different amounts of unsaturation. So what's the difference? Well, a cis isomer has the, uh, the hydrogens on the same side of the carbon, and the trans has them on opposite sides. 
And in terms of fatty acid composition, I don't anticipate that you'll be able to uh, read all of those uh, numbers of a fatty acid composition. But certainly when we look at a graph, you can see on the left hand side you've got palm oil, which is about 50% saturated, 50% unsaturated. You move to palm kernel and coconut, which are even more saturated. And then once you get to uh, rapeseed, you'll see that the unsaturated levels are significantly more. The first four, going from left to right, for us in the UK, we know them as fats, and the second four are oils. And you can see the differentiation between the amount of saturates, which means more fat, and the amount of unsaturates, which is more oil-like. That makes sense to everybody? Okay. Then we get to something called solid fat content. And this, for us, when we're working with oils and fats, shows the difference between a specific fat or an oil or a blend of such. And it's the amount of solid fat that exists in that oil at a given temperature. And as you increase the temperature, the amount of solid fat decreases. And at the melting point, the solid fat content is zero. I guess that makes sense. And we measure it by pulsed NMR. I often uh, mention that we use the acronym NMR simply because the N stands for nuclear and most people associate nuclear with radioactivity and glowing in the dark. It's nothing to do with radioactivity. You don't get any oils and fats that glow in the dark. It's like um, an MRI scanner but on a very, very tiny scale. And when we measure solid fat contents, we just abbreviate the temperatures with an N. So N10 is the solid fat content at 10 and N20 at 20 and so on. And if you look at a graph, you can see that at the lower temperatures, the, the, and this is just a typical uh, fat, there's a very hard, there's a very high amount of fat there. It's quite a hard product. It's very resistant to melting, even as you get up to 20 degrees. When you get to around 30, you can see you get into more of that main melting part of the fat itself. And then 35 and 40, you get almost uh, a completely molten product and it's a little bit waxy. And we measure generally at 10, 20, 30, and 35 and 40. And the reason for having 35 in there is that's generally the mouth temperature. Um, you know, your body temperature is around 37 degrees. If you're like me and you speak a lot, your mouth's generally a bit cooler. And so that's the temperature at which it will be in the mouth. So the amount of fat that will be there as we're chewing a food or a, a product that contains fat. And so just to give you an indication, that is the melting profile of palm oil. And we're going to be talking about palm oil today. That's palm kernel oil. Now palm kernels come from the same fruit as, as palm oil, but it's from the stone. If you imagine a plum, the palm is, comes from the flesh of the plum and the palm kernel from the stone. They're two very different oils. And you can see it melts in a very, very different way. That one is coconut oil, very similar to, to palm kernel, a little bit harder at the lower temperatures, melts just a little bit more quickly. And then shea, uh, I'm guessing most of you have not heard of shea in terms of food, but you've probably heard of shea butter. It's used in cosmetics and those sort of things. It's the same thing. That's the melting profile of shea. So it has a much higher melt profile. When we look at the sources of vegetable oils, a very, very rough uh, rule of thumb. Um, geography was not my strong point in school, uh, but where those uh, names are, are positioned on the world map is roughly the part of the world where they're grown. And these four oils, so palm and palm kernel, soy, sunflower, and rapeseed, they represent around 75% of the total global production of vegetable oils and fats. So you got sunflower just under 20 million tons. And this is from data from 2018. You got rapeseed just over 26 million. Soy just over 56 million tons. And then palm is 73 million tons. When you think about palm oil, uh, you can see it's clearly the, the global leader and it's only predicted to increase much more dramatically. Um, but in a broader context in the UK, UK refiners use only 0.62% of the total global palm oil that is produced. So not even two thirds of 1%.
and only around about 5.5% of the total amount of palm that's used across the EU. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to say this in about seven weeks, but I can say it still for the time being. And of those 73 million tonnes, around 19% is certified as sustainable palm oil. So not very much. For us at uh, AAK, we will deliver whatever our customers want. So if you want sustainable palm oil, we'll give you sustainable palm oil. But some customers, and there's different levels of sustainability, which I think we're going to come on to later today, some customers don't want to pay for the higher levels of sustainability. So we provide them with what they want. If you give me my choice, then I would switch everything to sustainable palm. But it has to be market driven. That's the key. In terms of uh, yields, different oil seeds um, and tree fruits and nuts give you different amounts of oil when you've harvested them. So you can see soybeans is only around about 20% oil. So certainly that 56.5 million tonnes of soybean oil that's, uh, that's grown and, and uh, refined each year is actually only one-fifth of the amount of what is taken out in terms of the bean. Four times more of that is the, the animal feed product that's left, the soy meal. And that goes into mainly into chicken uh, and pig feed, some into ruminants as well. Rapeseed meal, uh, sorry, rapeseeds is around about 40 to 44% oil. The remainder of that is rapeseed meal. That goes into animal feed as well, but much more into ruminants rather than into chickens and pigs. And you can see there's different quantities. In terms of palm and palm kernel, then they're around about 45 to 50% oil. And they're just some, some pictures of uh, certainly the top two very young palm trees and they're fresh fruit bunches. You can see they're quite big, those bunches. They, they contain quite a lot of fruit. And on the bottom right, you can just see uh, a palm fruit cut in half. The orange <coughs> part of the fruit is where you get the palm oil from. And palm oil, when you look at it as crude oil, looks like cold tomato soup. It's very, very red in colour. But the white part, the stone or the kernel in the middle, is where you get the palm kernel oil from. And that's just a very slight off-white colour as a crude oil. When it's refined, it's almost colourless. I'm sure some of you, particularly if you have hay fever, you'll, you'll see those uh, lovely yellow fields as we get into the spring and early summer. Those tiny black seeds are rape seeds. That's what we get out of those, uh, those yellow flowers. And they're harvested through, through the UK. Um, and they're crushed here in the UK as well. When it comes to oil refining, there's generally two types of oil refining. In basic terms, it's chemical and physical. One of the main uh, components that you look to get rid of during refining is free fatty acids and so from an acid perspective the way you get rid of it if you chemically get rid of it is you use an alkali you use a, a base product and so when you chemically refine you would neutralize wash any of the soap that you make because if you if you mix an acid and an alkali i don't know if you remember from your school days you do make soap it's a very uh, soapy type product and that's how you make soap that we buy and use from from the supermarkets today you dry the oil, you bleach it, filter it, and deodorize it. If you physically refine, then you do all of the work in terms of removing the free fatty acids in the deodorizer. So you physically move them by distillation. So there's no chemical neutralization step in there. And what determines whether you'd chemically or physically neutralize? Well, it's the economics more so than anything. The quality of the oil you've got and the losses. You get more losses if you chemically refine Physical refining is generally a little bit of a harsher process in terms of temperatures. So it depends on the, on the economics more so than anything. <laughs> and these components, well, they're all the things, and I suspect you've not he heard of all of them before, but these are all the things that oil refining takes out. And as oil refiners, we just deal with that. Um, and in most cases, the oils that you uh, get from the supermarket if you ever taste them, and I'm sure that very few of you have ever done that, you'll find that they're actually quite bland. It's just an oily texture and there's no taste. And that's really the point of a refined vegetable oil, that it carries flavors. 
So it does the job of carrying very well, but in and of itself, it's a very bland product. Generally, the most oft crude oil that we taste or that we use is olive oil. So extra virgin olive oil has that fruity, sometimes bitter flavor to it. And we like that because of the flavor. If, if I invited you all to taste some crude rapeseed oil or crude palm oil today, uh, I don't think there'd be many of you coming back for any seconds because it's not pleasant for, for what we like in our Western diet. And now modification. So if you've got these, all of these oils, you've refined them and so on, you have palm oil, which has got its own characteristics. You've got uh, rapeseed oil, which is a liquid oil, and again, its own characteristics, different fatty acid compositions. You can blend them together to modify them, but that's quite limited in terms of applications. And so we use a number of different modification techniques in terms of oils and fats to give us the end products that we need to make a functional uh, product. So blending, I've mentioned, it is simple, it's very low cost, but it's very limited in what you can achieve. You can hydrogenate. I'm guessing, if I can just ask by a show of hands, who's heard of hydrogenation here? So, okay, thank you, so most of you. And that's interesting. Um, would any of you accept hydrogenated oils in food? Again, show of hands. Wow, not one, that's interesting. And the, the reason for that is I guess the information that you've read about or that you know about concerning hydrogenation, probably linked to trans fatty acids, which generally are linked to coronary heart disease and poor health and so on and so forth. It's interesting that that's only a very small part of the story. I'm not gonna say it's not true, but there's a bigger part of the story. And I would eat, I suppose I should have put my hand up, I would eat foods that have hydrogenated oils in and not have any concerns about the health effects of them. But it depends on how they've been processed. So we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. Fractionation, any of you heard of fractionation? Okay, I've got four or five hands there. So much fewer than, uh, I, I guess you would, Andy. Okay, uh, and interesterification. Right, we're down to one, right, okay. Sorry, a couple at the front. So it's interesting, most have heard of hydrogenation, I guess because of Daily Mail and things that were in the news maybe 20 years ago relating to it. Um, maybe some of you have read or heard of Walter Willett's study. He was the Harvard professor who did a 30 year study of nurses and hydrogenated uh, oils and fats in, in the US. Um, very few about fractionation. It's a very simple process, but very uh, useful. And interesterification sounds um, very chemistry-like, I guess, and very few of you have heard of it, which is, which is interesting. You effectively take oil, you heat it up in the presence of hydrogen. I guess that's not a surprise. Uh, you use a catalyst to do so and you can turn an oil or a fat into a semi-solid oil or a harder fat. Um, so rapeseed oil, uh, you can take from being a liquid oil. It melts, if you, if you get it really cold, around minus 10, minus 11 degrees. Um, if you go back a few years in time, a lot of the fast food restaurants in the UK used a partially hydrogenated rapeseed oil, melting point around 20, 21 degrees Celsius. So you can see there's a significant difference. Going back even further, it was used in biscuit dough fats, biscuit cream fats, in cakes and so on. And that had a melting point of around 35 degrees. And today we still make a fully hydrogenated rapeseed has a melting point of around 62 degrees. So you can go from around minus 10 to 62 degree melting point with the same product, just with this one modification technique. The downside is the first two products I mentioned, they have quite high levels of trans fatty acids. The last one doesn't have any trans fatty acids in it because you've saturated all of the double bonds. And to, be a, to have a trans existing, you need some double bonds there. If you don't have any double bonds, you can't have any trans. So you react the hydrogen, uh, sorry, the oil with the hydrogen in the presence of a nickel catalyst, as I mentioned, and you can vary 
a number of things, temperature, hydrogen pressure, the type of catalyst, the speed at which you mix it and so on. Um, and you can tailor make a product to meet the customer's end requirements. Um, you would take a monounsaturated oleic acid, which is the one on the left, uh, and change it into elaidic acid. And they're both 18 carbons, one double bond. It's just the hydrogen is on the opposite side for the trans and the same side for the cis. And there's a huge difference in melting point. 13 degrees for the cis, 43 degrees for the trans. And I guess if you look at those and you got those as, um, as models, and you try to pack them into a, a, a rectangular cardboard box, you'd be able to get an awful lot more of the trans because they're more straight than the cis. Does that make sense? And when you think about that, you therefore need more energy to separate those trans fatty acids than you do the cis. And that's just simply why they have a higher melting point because they can pack together more easily. So in terms of that, rapeseed oil is on the left. The partially hydrogenated rapeseed oil is the second one. You can see there's not a great deal of difference apart from that red band on the right hand side, which is the trans fatty acid limit. The next one along is hydrogenated rape, which has a melt point of around 35, has much more trans and a much higher level of saturates. But the one on the right hand side is the one that we use today. It's used in uh, lots of products. It's actually also used in candles. So you can use it, it doesn't have to be still used for food. You can use it in non-food applications as well. Um, you'd need to blend it to make it a little bit softer, but it actually works well if you, if you make it with candles and put some nice smelling oils with it, and you can light it up and it smells nice in your living room at home, I guess. I don't like candles, but that's, that's a separate story. How does that look in terms of the melting profile? The first one you'll see, was, is you'll hardly be able to see it. The very bottom line on the graph is gonna change color and it just did, I don't know if you can see that. That's the liquid rapeseed oil. It doesn't have any solid fat at any temperature. The next one is the partially hydrogenated rapeseed oil. So it doesn't have many solids in it. Now, why would you do that? Well, you can see from there, it's still quite pourable. There's hardly any levels of fat in there at all. And if you subtract the amount of fat from 100, you get how much liquid oil. So if there is 5% solid fat, there's 95% liquid oil. So it's very pourable. Ideal for pouring into an industrial fryer in a fast food uh, restaurant or just in a restaurant train, uh, trade. Um, but the difference between this one and straight rapeseed oil is it lasts significantly longer in terms of frying performance because we've removed a lot of the polyunsaturates. Next one, you can see it's a significantly different melt profile. That's the hard rate melting point around 35, 36 degrees. That was ideal for use in biscuit creams maybe 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago. When you eat the biscuit cream, you, you bite into a biscuit, you start to break the cream down with the, the action of your teeth. The heat of your mouth also melts the fat crystals, releases the, the sugar, the flavors, and you have that nice experience. So you go and reach for a second biscuit, and that's the whole point of biscuits and cakes and chocolate and well I'll, I'll pause there and then the top line you can see it goes almost straight across the top that's the fully saturated rapeseed oil it's almost as hard at 40 degrees as it is at 10 degrees and that's because we're nowhere near the melting point but that one doesn't contain any trans fatty acids or a very very tiny amount therefore in terms of the issue with hydrogenation there isn't any issue with the trans and that's the one that I wouldn't have a problem eating, not by itself. If you tried to taste that, you'd be chewing it forever because you'd never be able to break it down. But you use that and you blend it and you compare it with and use other modification techniques, then it becomes a very useful and functional product. However, I do recognize that, and please don't take this the wrong way, the customer's always right, even when they're wrong. And so if your customer says, I don't want hydrogenated on my label, I don't want to have to declare that any of my products contain a hydrogenated fat, then you have to comply with their request. So the advantages of hydrogenation, it produces a hard <coughs> fat from a liquid oil, it improves stability, and that's a really big point. 
and it's very flexible and cost effective and you can produce products for a wide range of applications. The downside, it's a chemical process and the biggest issue is you produce trans fatty acids in partial hydrogenation, not in full hydrogenation. But I guess again if you, if you take all the health issues and everything else away and you tell me I can only use one modification technique to make an end product for a customer, this is the one I choose because it's the most flexible. You can do the most with it. Obviously you do have the downsides as well. Fractionation. This one's quite straightforward. Um, the two tanks you can see in this, uh, in this screenshot, they are at the tank where you would put uh, an oil. Palm oil is a typical one that would get fractionated and we do this at AAK. You have a several paddle stirrer and this is just mixing very slowly. It's not designed to break fat crystals, it's designed to equalize temperature. Around the outside of that stirrer, you can see two red bands on each side. That just shows that it's a water jacketed vessel. And you cool the palm oil to a certain temperature, and it doesn't matter what oil, you can do a variety of oils. And you allow crystals to form, but it still needs to be fluid, it still needs to be pumpable. What you then do is you pump that semi-crystalline liquid through a membrane filter. The hard crystals will get caught on the filter plates and the liquid oil will get pushed through and come out. The hard crystals are known as stearine and the liquid is known as oline. So you make palm stearine and palm oline. Has anybody heard of those? There's a few of you, okay. Palm, palm oline and palm stearine. What's interesting for this is you can actually take that palm oline and palm stearine and fractionate it a second time. And if you do that, you can make a double fractionated palm oling. And this is a palm product that is pretty much liquid at ambient temperature here in the UK. It'll have a tiny amount of solids, maybe one or two percent, 98, 99 percent liquid. Ideal for frying applications, very, very stable product, very easy to handle. You can almost, uh, you can also make, sorry, a double stearine so a very very hard palm stearine so hard that you can flake it and you can make fat flakes from it and you see you make palm mid fraction uh, mid stearine and so on and they're ideal for use in a variety of applications but mostly in chocolate if you read so the I'm, I'm quite sad it drives my wife mad if we go shopping most of the time she doesn't allow me to go shopping to the supermarket because I get left in an aisle reading the ingredients on products but if you read the ingredients on some chocolate milk chocolate particularly you'll find it contains palm or maybe shea or coke or milipe but palm is in there quite often because it's a lower cost product than you can use in some of the others the interesting thing that the percentages there gives you an indication of how much you get so if you fractionate 10 tons of palm oil you'll get approximately 8 tons of palm oleine and 2 tons of palm stearine you might say, well, why is that important? Well, it's important because if the palm steering is the thing that you can sell, but you struggle to sell the palm oline, you're making four times as much of the product that you're going to struggle to sell. So the smaller fraction has to take all of the costs and all of the premium, which makes it significantly more expensive. So it's a very useful way of modifying product it doesn't use any chemicals it's almost a natural process if you will but it has its limitations this graph just shows you some of the effects on the nutritional information so palm oil is on the left and round numbers palm oil is 50% saturates 40% monounsaturates 10% polyunsaturates if you move to palm oleine, you can see it actually doesn't change a great deal but you move to the palm steering, which is the fourth one along, there's actually more of a significant change. But you remember, for every ton of palm, you get 80% oleine and only 20% steering. And that's why the differences are more stark. And if you fractionate them again, you can see the IV-15, the double fractionated steering, is significantly harder and has more than 80% saturate in it. So again, useful in particular applications. What does that do to melt profile? Well, that's palm oil. We've already seen this one. Palm oleine is that yellow line. Palm stearine is the red line. 
there's going to be a grey line appear almost on the very bottom and that's the double fractionated palm oleum and that's why it's so useful for, uh, for restaurants, uh, people who need an oil that you can pour from a container because it's so easy to handle and it's very stable. And then the IV15, you can see, is significantly harder, has a much higher melting point. You can fractionate palm kernel oil and you make around 40% palm kernel stearine to 60% palm kernel oleine. This is one of the applications where there's not a lot of use for palm kernel oleine. Palm kernel stearine can be used in so many different things. It's exceptionally useful, particularly in confectionery, ice creams, but because you struggle to sell the palm kernel oleine, the palm kernel stearine has to take all of the extra premium. So it makes it a very expensive component. So the advantages of fractionation, it's a natural process. You can make some very useful, <coughs> excuse me, and very specialist products, but it's a fixed yield. So when you fractionate palm, you're always gonna have that roughly 80-20 split. You can move it a little bit. You maybe can get 85-15 or 75-25. You'll change the characteristics of each but you're not gonna be able to switch it to 50-50. That's just never gonna work. And so the economics depend on having the demand for both fractions. And that's the, that's the difficult part of it. <coughs> Interesterification. This word, I guess, frightens people because it's a long word and it sounds very chemistry-based. But what you effectively do is in the presence of a catalyst, you modify the structure of the triglyceride. And don't worry, I'm not gonna to get too chemistry based on you. <coughs> but it's a process that's done under heat uh, and vacuum. And you randomize the triglyceride and you produce a fat with very different properties. You might think, well, what's that all about? Well, if you look at this table here, you can see that uh, if you remember the triglyceride, so the backbone of glycerol, three fatty acids, if these fatty acids are all palmitic, which is a saturated fatty acid, then there's no double bonds, it has a 66 degree melting point. If they're all oleic acid, which is a monounsaturated, it has a melting point of minus 10. You think, great, okay. So if you have palmitic oleic palmitic, or palmitic palmitic oleic, it's still two palmitics, one oleic. But you can see there's a difference of almost five degrees in the melting point. Same fatty acids on the same glycerol backbone, just different positions. <coughs> and that's really what interesterification does. So it takes this standard base product that you have and it randomizes it. Not quite that way. <coughs> it was supposed to be, when, when I sent it, and I'm not very good at PowerPoint, so one of my colleagues did this. So the, the reds and the yellows were mixed up all the way through. I guess this has become corrupted a little bit. But what you have is the triglyceride composition after is a very different composition than the one before. The fatty acid composition, so the amount of saturates, monos, polys, they're exactly the same. You haven't changed that, you've just changed the order in which they are on that glycerol backbone. <coughs> and what does that do? Well, this is a, a palm steering palm kernel blend before you interesterify and then after. And you might look at that and say, well, that's not much different. It's a bit different, but not much different. If you use the top one in a cake or a biscuit cream, is probably a good example, you would chew the cream and you wouldn't find the biscuit a very pleasant experience, a cream-filled biscuit. The after interesterification, you would find, well, for me, you'd reach for a second biscuit because it releases the sugars, the flavors very well. You think, that was nice, I'll have another one. And that's the difference between those two. So the advantages, you don't form any trans fatty acids. The fatty acid composition is unchanged. The after product usually has more solids, more crystals than the starting material. Not all the time, but usually it does. The disadvantages, it's a chemical process. Sometimes you need complex raw material blends to actually get the finished products that you want. And most importantly, it doesn't improve stability. You would never use an interesterified oil for frying because it's pointless. You might as well use the 
un -inter -inter esterified oil because you've not changed it in any way to help the frying process and to help its stability. So with all of that background, and I was thinking of producing a quiz for this and I thought, no, I haven't got time and I'm sure it won't be well received. So I just wanted to outline just a couple of reasons why there are few alternatives to palm. So first of all, it's unlikely that any single oil or a simple blend will meet the requirements of a functional product that is based on or has palm oil in it. Now when I say functional, what I mean is the right crystal structure for, uh, for the product. And I'm gonna talk a little bit, these are all products here in front of me. This is not lunch, you can, be, you can be glad to hear. But these are all products that contain palm oil in different um, applications, different quantities, and different types of palm oil. Um, it's likely that you would need to use one or more of the modification techniques that are already identified, quite possibly following blending. And depending on the application, um, and it is application dependent, in summary, and I'm just looking at us in the UK now, if you don't want palm oil, you have your liquid oils. So rapeseed, soy, sun, sunflower, maize, olive, and they're hybridized varieties. Some of you have heard of Higher Lake sunflower oil. It's been around a few years now, Higher Lake rapeseed oil. And there's different hybridized varieties. They're the two most common ones that you've got. They're all liquid oils. So if you need a crystal structure, they won't work. You've got coconut oil. Now coconut oil works, however, and it's very good, but if you use coconut oil and you need some solid crystals there at mouth temperature, you're not gonna get it with coconut oil because it melts around 27 degrees. So it's completely, it's ideally an ice cream, but not so good for products where you want some, some texture, some mouthfeel. You've got shea. And shea is actually a very useful product, and particularly if you, if you fractionate it. One of the downsides of shea and some of the other tropical oils, such as the sal, mango kernel, coca milipe, and so on, is that they're in short supply, firstly, and because of the supply and demand, they're very, very costly. Now, I'm glad none of my commercial colleagues are here to kick me, but I suspect that shea versus palm oil, you're probably looking around four times the cost for every ton, maybe even five times the cost, depending on, on the application. And that's a significant impact. And if you imagine if you're buying oils and fats to use in a particular application, and the product goes from 600 pounds a ton to 3,000 pounds a ton, that makes your economics very, very difficult. And so, because of this, there are actually limited options to have other than palm oil. And so for, for me and for us at AAK, we would say, make sure that you use sustainable palm oil. And make sure it's the right level of certification for you. So this is my last slide, but in terms of discussion, I just wanted to take a moment just to show you some products, which I'm sure you've all seen, and they all contain palm oil. <coughs> so, I don't know if any of you are vegetarian or vegan or flexitarian or whatever other label you want to attach to yourself, but corn burgers, um, corn is based on mycoprotein, so it's a protein uh, from the mushroom family and it's, uh, it's harvested from that. But if you actually have it by itself, this mycoprotein, it's not a very pleasant product. And nobody should hear from corn, are they? I should have asked that first. One of the things that you need to do if you're making a burger, when you eat a burger, if you eat a beef burger, you want to have that, that sensation in your mouth where you have a fatty mouthfeel, uh, a fatty taste. It releases some of those pleasant flavours. That's why you eat it. And so in this corn burger, or in the corn, corn burgers that this uh, had around it, there are uh, some fat flakes. And they're 100% palm-based uh, with some of the modification techniques we've already talked about, not hydrogenation. Um, and they're used to give that more pleasant mouthfeel, that more pleasant texture. The succulents, I guess, is probably the best way of describing it. And you get that from palm oil flakes that we have in this particular product. 
This is a, a vegetable quiche from Marks and Spencers. It was very nice. I ate this over the weekend. <laughs> I thought I'd keep the box. Um, and the quiche, you know, it's got a filling and it has the, the pastry, the base and the sides. Um, the interesting thing about this particular quiche is the, the fillings are, are quite soft uh, and have a lot of liquid in them. The challenge was that it was soaking into the pastry, making the pastry very soggy and making it kind of a not as pleasant an experience to eat as you would want. So we developed a particular fat, a blend of fats in margarine, and we've used that in, uh, in the base for this, uh, and they are palm oil based, and we've managed to make a harder pastry base, which is more resistant to those uh, aqueous parts of the filling soaking in, and you get I think, it's one of my colleagues who's done this, not me, but I think you get an extra three days shelf life out of this than you did previously. And we did that with, with palm oil. I'm guessing you, you, you're gonna be able to tell that I'm talking about palm oil all the way through this. Bourbon cream biscuits from Sainsbury's. So a bourbon cream is, is quite simple. It's, it's two biscuit shells with some cream in the middle. The biscuit shell is just a very straightforward dough fat based again on palm oil. Um, the cream is the interesting part of, of this. Uh, when you're looking for a cream fat, it needs to be hard enough that when you stencil it onto one side of the biscuit, that it actually sticks and doesn't flow, but it needs to be soft enough to adhere to that shell, so you don't want it falling off. But it also needs to be soft enough that when you put the top on, there is a gluing effect, that there's an adhering effect, but hard enough that the weight of that, and then when they're turned and pushed together in a pack, it's not soft enough that it squeezes out. It's quite a lot of technology, isn't it? Just for a cream and a biscuit. And that's what exists in these products, and that's based on palm oil too, in the, and palm kernel oil, in the cream filling in the biscuit. Um, Bisto, Bisto gravy granules. I'm sure a lot of you have used this on your, on your Sunday lunch. This contains uh, a very uh, hard palm fraction a blend with other palm uh, products in it and it's used to spray dry to make these gravy granules. So when you put the hot water in and you make your gravy, it gives you that lovely thick texture and nice mouthfeel that releases those beef flavours that you get when you try gravy granules. Um, this lemon Madeira cake, we use a palm based uh, margarine in the sponge, which is a very soft margarine. And in the middle, actually, is a palm-based butter replacer that we've developed. So you can actually take butter out and replace it with this product. And we've used that in this, uh, in this buttercream filling. Again, based on palm oil. Um, Kit Kat. I'm guessing most of you don't know. You'll know from the picture on the front, a Kit Kat's a chocolate-covered wafer biscuit. Did you know that between each level, each layer of layers, there is a tiny amount of cream? Did you know that? No, that's interesting. I've seen Kit Kats being made. It's a fascinating process. But that cream is, I'm sure you, you know what I'm going to say now, is based on a palm oil fraction. And it's been interesterified. And that gives you that lovely texture when you eat a Kit Kat and you get that from the cream. And my last example, before I run out of time, is uh, Rocky Biscuits. So in a Rocky Biscuit, it's a chocolate covered biscuit with this biscuit um, centre and some caramel on the top. Problem with caramel is it has some water in it. And if you don't protect the biscuit, the caramel soaks into the biscuit. When you come to eat it, it's quite soggy. You don't get that snap, that nice feel, which you want when you eat a Rocky biscuit. And so we've developed a barrier fat that you spray onto this biscuit after it's been made before you apply the caramel. So the caramel then doesn't soak into the biscuit because the fat provides a barrier. And I'm sure it's going to be a shock to you to know that's based on palm oil. And so I just brought these products along just to highlight some of the things that you can do with palm oil and some of the applications we've got. And, you know, some of my colleagues know this, but if you, if you just let me talk, I'll keep talking for the rest of the day about palm and vegetable oils and refining. But my time is almost up. Okay, thank you very much.